Hello, and you're very welcome to our Chagas Broadleaf webinar on managing young forests for quality. My name is Nuala Nilahartha. I'm head of the Chagask Forestry Development Department, and I'm your host for this event. We're coming to you tonight in collaboration with the Forestry Division of the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. I'm joined here for the next hour or so by Liam Kelly and Noel Kennedy, Chagask Forestry Advisors, and Oliver Sheridan and Dr. Ian Short, Chagask Forestry Researchers. So first, I'll ask each of our panellists to introduce themselves. Good evening. My name is Liam Kelly. I'm a Chagas Forestry Advisor based in Mullingar. I provide independent forest advice um, information and support to farmland and forest owners in the Midland Counties. I also have a national event coordination role with the Chagas Forestry Development Department. Good evening. My name is Noel Kennedy. I'm a Chagas Forestry Advisor based in Roscommon covering the Western Counties. Uh, I'm providing advisory support services to forest owners and to farmers and landowners considering a forestry option. Hello, my name is Oliver Sheridan. I'm a forestry researcher with the Chagas Forestry Development Department, working on broadleaf improvement of birch and alder. Hello, my name is Ian Short. I'm broadleaf silviculture researcher with the Chagas Forestry Development Department, and I also specialise in alternative silviculture systems. Thank you for that. And we also have John Casey, who's the Chagas Forestry Advisor for Cork and Waterford with us, and he'll look after your questions this evening. Um, the format of our event is three videos taken in the forest where different aspects of broadleaf management are outlined. The issues raised in each video will then be discussed with our panel. This will be followed by a Q&A session. And remember, this is a live event, and you can submit your questions using Zoom's Q&A function. If you're on a laptop, this Q&A button is probably at the bottom center of your screen, while if you're on a tablet or a smartphone, it's probably at the top of your screen. You can submit your questions at any time, and we'll get to as many of them as possible later. Now, uh, also just bear in mind, that this webinar is being recorded. So now we go to our first video on the early management of broadleaves for a quality crop, where we meet Kevin O'Connell, who is our Chagask Northeast Forestry Advisor based at Ballyhays County Cavan. Kevin discusses the importance of good planning and early management in the production of quality in broadleaf trees. In this video, we'll examine the factors that will help us produce quality timber from a broadleaf woodland. Growing quality broadleaf woodlands begins with the assessment of the site. Factors such as good drainage, presence of a mineral soil, suitable pH, low elevation above sea level and a sheltered site will all favour the production of high quality hardwood timber given suitable management. Species grown well in adjacent hedgerows and woodlands with similar soil type may be an indicator of species suitability. When suitable species for the site has been selected, good quality planting stock should be used. It is important to note that the trees we plant now will only produce the highest quality timber in the future if a suitable seed source is used. Tree improvement programs have been running for many broadleaf species for several decades, resulting in the commercialisation of improved planting stock. For example, the qualified downy birch from the improved programme, which began in 1998 and became commercially available in 2017. The initial planning of the site layout is very important for future management. You have to take into consideration the direction of the planting lines and indeed their internal road planning. This is important in the future when you're coming to harvest, allowing easy access for the like of woodland machinery such as quad bikes, tractors and indeed harvesting machinery. Once the trees are planted, the subsequent management has an impact on their future quality. Management such as weed control, protection from browsing animals, and importantly, formative shaping. Formative shaping is the removal of any forks or excessively heavy side branching. This normally takes place when the trees get to three to four years of age. Ideally, we like to get about 60% of the grown trees shaped. Some of these then will later go on to be the potential crop trees at first thinning. These are some of the tools we use to formative shape. It will depend on the size and the age of the trees. For young trees with small branches, a secateurs can be used. For medium sized branches, a loppers is quite handy and for giving you reach as well. And then when you have excessively 
heavy side branching, a small pruning saw is ideal. In this video we have seen that good planning and early management is necessary for the production of quality broadleaf trees. So lots of important issues raised there by Kevin. Um, in the video Kevin mentioned a suitable soil pH for growing quality broadleaf leaves. What is a suitable soil pH? Yeah, pH is a measure of how acidic or alkaline the soil is. Um, the range is normally from three and a half up to 10, with seven being neutral. Anything under seven is considered acidic and anything over seven then is considered al alkaline. Um, the main, uh, most broadleaves prefer um, uh, slightly acidic or less than uh, neutral um, pH, um, such as oak, pedunculate oak likes 4.5 to seven, sessile oak normally four to five, uh, and even Spanish chestnut is four to five. Uh, beech is from six to 7.5. Uh, cherry likes a neutral pH around seven. Uh, sycam sycamore tolerates a calcareous um, soil from five and a half to seven and a half. And uh, alder then has a wide range. Uh, it likes a pH above six, but it's a quite a wide range. So that just gives an indication of some of the species that we commonly plant here in Ireland. And Ian, following on from that, um, if someone is considering planting broadleaves on an area of their farm, as well as a pH, how do they know where the, whether the site is actually suitable for broadleaves or not? Well, I suppose first of all, broadleaves do prefer a sheltered position. So having a sheltered location is a benefit. Secondly, is to look at the soil and um, dig a small soil pit just to have a look and see what the soil profile is like. And you can compare that against a publication that we have on the Tagusk Forestry website that, um, that will give you an illustration of whether the soil type is most suitable for conifers or broadleaves. After that, I would suggest then going to the Chagas Forestry Advisors or um, taking on professional forester to provide more site-specific advice and then take it from there. Okay, uh, that's uh, interesting. And I suppose, I mean, with the best will in the world, there's a lot of concern out there, Liam, about ash dieback disease amongst ash forest owners. Now, we won't be covering the management of crops affected by ash dieback during this particular webinar, Liam, will we? No, we, uh, this event will cover um, uh, the management of broadleaves, um, but the ongoing spread of ash dieback in Ireland has a very serious implication for the future of our ash woodlands as already experienced uh, across Europe. Um, affected plantation will require restructuring in, in time. Um, the current reconstitution and underplant scheme funded by the Department of Agriculture does provide some options for some of the younger plantations. Um, each woodland will need to be looked at uh, separately and uh, different uh, responses will be required. Now, Chagas ourselves, we have uh, ran events in the past in relation to uh, the remedial civil culture of, of ash uh, affected sites, and we will have follow up events um, in the near future. Um, we are also constantly monitoring the situation and providing uh, local advice to uh, affected uh, woodland owners. So we will be having an event in the future. We just, just haven't it re ready at the moment. Okay, thanks for that, Liam. And I think it's important to make, to make that point uh, in relation to this evening. Um, Noel, what are the key messages in relation to management for the forest owners um, who have very young broadleaf forests? Well, Nula, I think there's increasing interest in the planting of broadleaves. And uh, I think the key message uh, that we'd like to get across here tonight is that the early establishment of those young broadleaf trees and young broadleaf forests is essential to longer term health and quality and timber production. And um, by establishment, we're talking about um, the management focusing on growing trees that are healthy, clear of vegetation, uh, and ensuring that there is a sufficient number of trees to promote that uh, successful longer term forest development. Uh, normally, it's four years really that we consider is the establishment period. And indeed, uh, the afforestation grant scheme requires that all forests are established by year four. And this is, this is linked to the payment of the, the second installment of the afforestation grant. As regards operations, you're really talking about vegetation control, which is becoming more and more manual in approach, which means better timing and better planning. It's, it is more challenging, but uh, it is a much more sustainable approach. Um, tree stocking, um, as close to full tree stocking by year four is required uh, under the afforestation grant. 
And as Kevin mentioned there, uh, formative shaping in your, in your broadleaf crops, um, certainly as early as maybe year three, but certainly by year four, to begin that process of improving the stem quality for longer term production. Um, just one other thing I'd like to say is the communication. Um, a lot of forest owners there with young broadleaf forests will have a forester involved with them for the first four years to look after that. And it's very important that there is good and uh, you know regular communication and two-way communication between you and your forester because uh, it's vitally important that you understand uh, what the forester is doing, what is required in terms of management, and that um, you know this can can feed into the the overall quality management of a young plantation. And Noel, can I just um, get a clarification there in relation to you talked about manual weed control? Uh, the alternative to that would have been chemical weed control that we that's not used as much nowadays. Would that be fair to say? That, that, that's correct. Now, I mean, my, uh, both have their, their positives and negatives, but I think it, in, in today's, I suppose, more environmentally sensitive, um, you know, climate and, and indeed where a lot of the broadleaf sites are being planted on what might be described as environmentally sensitive, um, manual grass, con grass control um, is desirable and indeed will be a requirement as opposed to her herbicide control on some sites. Yeah, and then Lee, moving on from that, another issue that we often see in some of these broadleaf crops that are becoming more prevalent around the country is the whole issue of deer browsing. Do they actually have an impact on the growth of quality broadleaf crops? Because a lot of people look at the deer and they say they're lovely to have around. So what's your take on that one? Yeah, no, uh, where deer are present, it's very difficult to grow quality woodlands. Um, where large numbers of deer congregate and crops, considerable damage will occur. And the main damage usually is browsing, bark stripping and breakage of stems and, and uh, side branches. And, uh, you know, when you, have a, when you see that consistently occurring across the crop, it's, it's difficult to get a, a crop established, number one, even to get to year four. Um, but also then as time goes on, it's difficult enough to find a, um, enough good trees to sustain a crop. And, you know, many foresters and landowners avoid planting broadleaf species in very vulnerable areas, which is disappointing, I suppose, because it reduces the overall forest composition uh, as, a, as, a, as a nation. Um, you know, even in the recent the NIS or the National Forest Inventory in 2017, um, biotic damage was noted as up to 25% of the in the forest area, and 37% of that biotic damage was considered to be done by deer. Um, so you can see the impact of deer. Um, you know, and to grow quality broadleaves, uh, we really need to um, have the deer excluded from the site, uh, either fencing or maybe in small areas uh, or individually, you protect each tree individually with a suitable tree guard. But it is important if a fence goes up or if tree guards are put in, that they are maintained. Um, like a, a deer fence is only as good as its weakest link and deer are very um, cunning. They will try and um, get through a fence. So it has to be put up and, and maintained properly to ensure that uh, the crop remains uh, intact. And becoming an increasingly big problem deer around the country, Liam, I think. Yeah? Yes, um, at the moment it's estimated that the population of deer could be up to 200,000 uh, across the, and that's steadily increasing. So that's, that's a, an ongoing issue. Um, so, uh, you know, effective culling probably is, will be required in certain areas to ensure that the numbers are maintained at a, a reasonable level. Okay, and going back to the video, Oliver, there was a mention of improved birch being available. Can you explain how a long-term research project like your Birch and Alder program can result in plants being available for grant-aided woodland creation projects? Uh, well, the, the Birch Improvement Program, the Chagas Birch Improvement Program has been running now just for over 20 years. Um, and based on the, the Chagas research um, of this improved birch material, it's available now commercially uh, from a large commercial nursery in partnership with ourselves. Um, now, provided um, uh, farmers uh, use this material, it, the improved material has been added to the species list uh, by the department and it's um, eligible for grant and premium GPC-8 with alder uh, as a pure crop for commercial timber production. Okay, thanks for that, Oliver. Um, at this stage, we are going to go back out to the forest to meet Kevin O'Connell again where he explains what a potential crop tree or a PCT is and how to select them in a broadleaf forest.
Potential crop trees known as PCTs are trees selected of high quality during the tilling process. These trees are intended to go on to produce quality saw log. There are four criteria used for the selection of PCTs. Firstly, disease free. PCTs must be free from disease as there's no advantage in selecting trees that are diseased. Secondly, good stem quality. PCTs have the best stem form of those trees available within that specific location. Trees with good stem form are straight but no major defects, preferably up to 6 metres height, but often 4 metres or 5 metres is the best achievable. Thirdly, good vigour. PCTs have good crowns and good growth rate. They tend to be larger than the average size. And remember, the crown of the tree is the engine of the tree. The larger the crown is, the more photosynthesis, the greater growth rate there will be. And fourthly, good distribution throughout the woodland. PCTs should be relatively evenly spread out through the woodland. When selecting PCTs, it is good practice to view the tree from two sides. A tree that looks good from one side can look poor from the other side and therefore should not be selected as a PCT. Potential crop trees should be selected and marked with a ring of permanent paint so that it can be easily identified from all sides. One easy way of making sure you've got the correct number of PCTs marked per hectare with a good even distribution is the two-stick method. And more on the two-stick method can be found on our YouTube channel. We normally select PCTs when we're preparing for first thinning. Thinning is the next step in the management of our woodlands and should always be carried out where possible. We will take a closer look at thinning in another video. Noel, if forest owners are planning to thin their forest, will they need a felling licence? Yes, Nuala, they will need a felling licence uh, under the 2014 Forestry Act and indeed going back many, many decades. Um, if you want to fell trees in a forest, uh, be it for a thinning or, or, or uh, other, other felling reasons, um, you will need a, a, a felling licence. Um, so the owner will need to apply to uh, the Department of Agriculture for a felling licence approval. Uh, and uh, with good planning, I suppose, uh, and scheduling different uh, thinning operations, that license can be extended to a 10 year period and indeed further extended up to a total of five years. So if there's good planning, uh, a, a, an owner can potentially have a license for operations for the next maybe 15 years. Now, as, you're, as the viewers are probably aware, um, there are significant delays in the issuing of felling licensing licenses at the moment. So our advice, I suppose, is to um, forward plan. So if you are hoping to thin in the next two to three years, apply now for your felling license. And indeed, if you need to put in a forestry entrance or build a forest road, uh, apply now for that road grant so that you will have approval got in good time and that uh, you will be able to carry out your scheduled operations. Uh, in good time. So a lot of forward planning and uh, leaving plenty of time necessary in relation to getting licenses in place. Would that be fair to say, Noel? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And moving on from that, Liam, um, just back into the forest as such, grey squirrels have been a major concern, particularly in broadleaf forests for a lot of years. Um, do they actually have an impact on the crop? And is there any implication for selecting potential crop trees or PCTs? Yes, um, grey squirrels were a big issue, I suppose, mainly in, in broadleaves and mainly in the midlands and east areas um, from the mid 2000s onwards, really. Uh, now, in the latter few years, uh, the numbers seem to have dwindled, and the red squirrel again has started to recolonize some of the areas that the grey squirrels had, had taken over. Um, broadleaves, I suppose, are vulnerable to grey squirrel attack. Um, especially the light um, barked trees, um, maybe from about year, six years of age up to about 40 years of age. So there's a big area, big, big uh, area where they're vulnerable to attack. And uh, the main species, I suppose, um, that were vulnerable were sycamore and beech and, and oak and some other species as well, but mainly the light uh, barked uh, species. Um, they they um, stripped the bark. Um, and this leads into discoloration of the timber, uh, wind snap if they completely ring, ring um, um, strip the, the, the tree or the stem of the tree, uh, and then disease and fungal attack can also occur. Um, so it greatly reduces the commercial viability of, of the actual woodland. And uh, I suppose one of the aspects what I would have seen was they attacked a lot of times they, fast, they attacked the faster growing trees, and in lots of cases they were the potential crop trees or potentially the 
potential crop trees. Mm -hmm. So there is legacy issues and uh, in some of the sites mm -hmm. and um, it can lead to difficulty in finding enough suitable PCTs. It reduces the value of the, the site to mainly firewood material. And also maybe when it comes to harvesting, um, there can be health and safety issues with, with uh, cutting the trees or uh, extracting the, the, the disease stems as well. So it is okay. an issue. And, um, but I, thank, thankfully, as far as we can see, the, the pressure from grey squirrels isn't as great as it was. And of course, uh, bear in mind that the native red squirrel is not the one that's causing the damage. It's no. the introduced one, the grey squirrel. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, Ian, moving back to potential crop trees, how should they be marked for first thinning, say, in sycamore? How many of them should you mark? Um, for sycamore, you'd be marking 300 to 350 um, potential crop trees per hectare. Now, this can be done, as, as Kevin mentioned in the video, uh, it can be done using the two stick method. And there's a, another video on the YouTube channel for that. Um, so with that, uh, with that video, you, you select, you'd have 40 trees that you're then selecting either four to five or three to four potential crop trees out of those 40 trees, depending on whether you've got 2,500 stocking or 3,300 initial stocking. And that will then give you your, your 300 to 350 potential crop trees per hectare if you carry out that procedure. Okay, and they're very important once they're marked because they're the trees that are going to be the major cash crop at the end of the rotation with broadleaf. Yes, and with those potential crop trees, about half of those would probably be the final crop and the other half will come out as later thinnings, which would also be potentially small saw log, which would have higher value as well. Thanks for that. And Oliver, um, I know we're talking about timber production mostly tonight, but I think it's important to value the multiple benefits of our forest as well. Um, and apart from the likes of birch and alder, say, being native species, what benefits can an owner expect from planting birch and alder? And you might also just cover the use of these timbers as well. Well, there's no doubt that birch and alder have many benefits. Um, for instance, in relation to, to birch, um, they have a shorter rotation than many other broadleaves. Um, from a recreational and uh, mental health benefit, um, the the uh, and it's 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 well recorded. The walking even just through uh, birch woodlands uh, can enhance enhance your mental health. Um, and even the, the even the little bit of dappled shade, you're not in a very heavy shade, uh, which in turn can reduce stress. Uh, it can lower blood pressure and it can also improve uh, your mood. Um, from a biodiversity point of view. Um, there's a large number of species actually that feed or live on, um, on birch, including many different types of fungi, herbivores, and of course, uh, saprozylic uh, insects. Those are insects that feed on a dead or decaying wood. Um, now, there's also the other aspect to uh, sap, the many benefits from birch sap, uh, the health benefits, um, of course, is, is well recorded as well. Now, the, the wood from, from birch, it's light in colour, so it is. Um, so it's a light coloured wood, and it's got very good calorific value, so it's very good for burning. Um, the, um, from a bioeconomy uh, point of view, for instance, in Finland, uh, they manufacture cellulose uh, from birch. They spin fibres into yarn, and then they turn, turn this yarn into fabric uh, to make clothes. Now, they... they, they, they this is very good for the environment because the material is fully actually fully recyclable. Now, in, in relation to the alder, um, alder is a, a rapid growing tree, as you know, and it's uh, got an abundant uh, amount of leaf litter, which is very high in nitrogen, uh, which is fed back into the, into the soil. It also has the ability to fix atmospheric nitrogen. Um, and this makes um, alder very suitable for planting with other species to benefit other species, such as walnuts, for instance. Um, now, again, uh, the species contributes uh, to riverine eco ecosystems and to biodiversity by providing habitats for specific flora and fauna, both within the tree and in the flooded root systems. So if you're um, where nature conservation and watershed management uh, are as important as timber production, all that should be considered for planting uh, in, in alluvial or marshy marshy ecosystems. Now, the, the wood, again, has, has many uses. For instance, um, 
the, uh, it can be used for energy. The fiber also used for paper. If you have good uh, saw log, um, it can be used for furniture making and veneer. So um, the grain is, a, it's, when, you cut the, um, when you cut the timber, it's light in color, but very quickly oxidizes to a nice uh, rustic, rustic color, which is very, I suppose, um, um, nice, particularly for the likes of furniture makers. Okay. That's um, so the, the poor man's sick of our mahogany. Is mahogany, to call that's, it. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and do remember, this is a live session and you can ask questions by posting them using the Zoom Q&A function on your screen. John, are there any questions coming in at this stage that we should address? Uh, most of the questions I think you've covered already. One of the questions would be going back to the Liam was covering there about weed control. Uh, when should weed control start as in what are the indications that it's required and how frequently should it be repeated is one of those. Okay, um, Liam, would you like to take that one? Yeah, I, I suppose if, you know, if you see that um, the, 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 if you're carrying out manual control, if you notice that the tree, the, the grass is getting above the, the, the young trees, you know, and you can't see the trees, uh, I would strongly recommend that it should be uh, walked down at that stage. Uh, this time of the year, you can see the, the, the vegetation is headed out, so it's, it's, it's quite strong. And, um, you know, if, if you feel that it's overcoming and smothering the trees, I would strongly recommend that uh, um, some manual or weed control should, should be carried out. Um, and later on the winter, um, sometimes the vegetation, as it falls down, it can be equally as, as uh, problematic. It falls down in the trees and, and um, um, the trees then can fall down with it as well and find it difficult to get back up. So, you know, I'd be monitoring the crop at this stage and if anyone has concern, maybe to talk to their forester or our uh, Chagas advisor and uh, we will uh, hopefully um, um, advise them what, what is required at that stage. Okay, uh, that's okay. So, John, is there, have you anything so, else there? Yeah, there was just one other question yeah. there. It might be related to Oliver's work. Somebody was asking about the provenance of broadleaf planting uh, and importing stock. And what is the situation with the native seedling supply? In relation to importing um, foreign stock, uh, you have to be very careful because birch doesn't travel too well. And um, recommendations don't uh, say that uh, not to move birch any more than uh, maybe two or three uh, degrees latitude north-south. So be very careful because uh, while a lot of uh, work has been carried out um, in the likes of some of the Scandinavian countries and they have produced very, very good quality, very high quality uh, birch, um, it's, it's important not to, to uh, think that, well, why not use that material? Because um, while it'll establish maybe reasonably well over time, it'll deteriorate. So um, it's 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 always it's always uh, more important to use uh, the material that's that's local to you, uh, and to use the improved material. Yeah, I think that's uh, very good advice there, Oliver. And it probably cuts across to the other species too that local provenances tend to be better. And the department, I think, have a list of approved sources as well, don't they, for uh, seed sources for the different species, the different broadleaf species. Now we go back to Kevin again in the forest, where he explains first thinning and what preparations and planning are needed to ensure the success of that operation. In this video, we will look at the thinning of broadleaf woodlands and the preparations involved in making them a successful operation. So what is thinning and why do we need it? Initially we plant a lot of trees to the hectare but we have to remove a certain portion of the stems to allow more room for the better quality trees to grow. In a pure broadleaf woodland thinning normally starts when they reach a height of 8 to 10 metres. However, if your broadleaves are planted in a mixture with Scots pine or larch, you may have to intervene earlier. Sometimes the conifer crop will outgrow and dominate the broadleaf trees around them. Normally at first thinning time you will be planning your access routes into and through your woodland to facilitate the harvesting operations and subsequent management. This normally means the removal of lines of trees. These are called racks. Generally they're 4 metres wide. Racks are placed at intervals between 14 and 20 metres apart. These racks will allow for future management operations in our woodlands, the extraction and the selection and thinning of trees. While thinning, Keep an eye out for these trees because these will have to be removed at this stage to improve the overall health of your crop. 
Now that we've selected our PCTs, we must look at other trees that are competing with it, particularly up in the canopy. These trees will have to be removed because they're encroaching on the crown of our good PCTs. Smaller trees like we have here can be left in situ. They're not competing with anyone and uh, they're, they're doing no harm. Normally we remove two to three competitors around our selected PCT. These should be marked with paint to make the felling and harvesting operations a lot easier. Anything between 30% and 50% of the standing trees may be removed in first thinning. This will all depend on the site, the species and other factors. In first and second thinning, the size of the trees removed are small and really only go to make firewood. However, in subsequent thinnings, larger sized trees will be removed and this will give us a better choice in end uses. Fell trees are delimbed, cut into lengths and presented to the rack for extraction. The tops and the branches are placed on the rack to protect the soil from damage if heavy machinery is being used. A critical operation in this part of the thinning process is the high pruning of selected PCT trees. High pruning is the removal of dead and live branches up to ideally a height of 6 metres on the stem. Pruning is normally carried out in two operations or lifts. This increases the length of knot free timber and increases the value of the tree. High pruning together with releasing the crown from competitors during first thinning operations will help to produce PCTs of optimum quality, vigour and value. The take home message from this video is that thinning is a very important operation, not only for the production of quality broadleaves but also for enhancing the biodiversity value of your woodlands. And I think Kevin's take home message regarding the importance of thinning broadleaves is well worth reiterating and he gives a good overview of the steps involved and I'd like to just thank Justin Good as well for his contributions to that video. Um, going back to the panel, we just saw Justin cutting a tree in the wood there, Liam. What are the health and safety issues around managing broadleaf crops? Yeah, it's very important that we remain safe in our woods. This is actually National um, Farm Safety Week and the team is reducing risk. So, um, you know, it's important that you're aware of what's, what's uh, health and safety uh, risks are around you. Um, and a lot of landowners or forest owners like to get involved with their uh, broadleaf management. Um, so, and chainsaws, I suppose, is what we all, uh, most uh, landowners will try and use when they're um, carrying out thinning in, in their woods. And chainsaws are particularly dangerous. No one should use a chainsaw without appropriate training or wearing the proper PPE at all times. As uh, demonstrated by Justin there in the video, he had the full PPE on, he had the chainsaw trousers, boots, a combo helmet, including the visor and muffs and, and gloves. Um, <clears throat> there are also a number of training um, providers that provide training in relation to chainsaw safety and, and chainsaw use. So it is important to have a chainsaw course done. Um, the ch chainsaw itself should also be functional with all the safety features and in good working order. That is very important. And uh, from the video, you will also see that there are many um, aids that help now in relation to cutting and the carrying of timber as well. And some of those aids make it much easier, easier in your back and things like that. From a loan um, policy point of view, I suppose, avoid working on your own or, um, or at least inform someone where you're going to be working. And like a lot of the woods, a lot of our woods are quite large, you know, there could be 20, 30 hectares. And if something did go wrong, you know, it can be difficult to find someone. So it is important maybe to tell someone not alone what wood you're in, but maybe what part of the wood you might be in as well. And always have a charged phone with you, you know, a charged mobile phone. Um, and also be aware of the weather conditions as well. You know, even for example, this current uh, heat uh, wave that we're getting through, you know, the temperatures are very warm and, you know, always have plenty of water with you if you're working out in, the, in conditions of today, in the days like today. So those are just some of the safety issues that I, I would say that all forest owners should be aware of. Just take care. The woods are lovely to work in, but are lovely places to work, but just, just be careful. Yeah, and exactly. And particularly if people are working on their own, as you say. Yeah. Um, Noel, um, I suppose first thinning of broadleaves in particular may not be such a profitable operation. The dimensions of the trees are quite small and maybe not really suitable for maybe stakes or anything like that. Is there any support available to owners to thin their broadleaf forests? Yeah, well, certainly, Noel, uh, you know, thinning broadleaves brings its own sort of challenges, both practically and, and from an economic perspective. And, and that's, that's recognised by the Department of Agriculture. 
Uh, and there is grant aid support uh, for forest owners uh, through the Woodland Improvement Scheme, which, uh, which now supports um, two thinnings, a first and a second thinning for forest owners. So the grant rates are currently uh, 750 euro per hectare for a first thinning and 500 euro per hectare for a second thinning. And that second thinning must take place within about a five year interval from the first thinning. And what's interesting actually is that that grant aid is not only available to um, forests that have, were planted under a grant, but it's also available to non-grant aided forests. So there could be um, small woodlands out there on farms that uh, were not grant aided and uh, they are now uh, open to um, a woodland improvement grant to support thinning. Um, and the woodland improvement grant application uh, must be submitted through a registered forester. So some of the operations that are covered by the, the grant include obviously um, the thinning or felling of, of, of trees to release uh, potential crop trees uh, and the follow up, I suppose, thinning or respacing of, of the woodland to promote growth. But also where there may be um, a lot of natural regeneration, which might come later in the cycle, uh, the management and respacing of, of uh, th that natural regeneration. Um, I suppose another interesting development there under the Woodland Improvement Grant is the uh, to facilitate owners who are interested maybe in the idea of continuous cover forestry. And um, there is now a CCF scheme uh, under the Woodland Improvement Scheme, which supports a, a transformation management plan over a 12 year period. And this grant is paid in three installments of 750 euro per hectare. Um, occurring at, at intervals throughout that, that 12 year period. And again, application to be made through a registered forester. So, um, you know, there's good support there from the department. And I suppose with the focus tonight on thinning, it's good to know that um, uh, that support is there to assist with those operations. Yeah, and Noel, just a, a question that came in just before the event. Um, an owner has a six year old broadleaf plantation that's a mixture of oak and birch does the owner need an ongoing management plan to include the pruning of selected trees and the cutting of weaker trees? And they also ask as well whether Chagas assists in drawing up such a management plan and if we provide <coughs> advice and site visits. And I suppose it's in the context of it probably not being viable to contract out the work in the shorter term. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question and it's great that uh, that forest owner is, is so aware of, uh, you know, the, the planning that, that will be required for the future management. Now, unless his plantation is over five hectares and over um, 11 years of age, um, there isn't a requirement for a, a mandatory uh, management plan. But certainly some even a basic management plan, even at year six, uh, would be a very, very good idea because um, management plans, they provide a focus um, on management and a timeline as to when to carry out that management. And I think it's, it's, it's also great to promote the owner in interest and involvement. Um, now, as I said, for areas over five hectares for, for broadleaf and indeed over 10 hectares for conifers, when they come to year, uh, year 11, uh, the Department of Agriculture does require that they submit a, a a management plan that will bring them to year 20. But at the moment, there is some uh, support uh, through the forestry pre premium scheme to contribute to the cost of that. Um, and certainly, in then in to say the Chagask involvement in it. Yeah, certainly uh, we're there to provide advice and information. Um, and I think what I would encourage all forest owners uh, is to go out and seek as much as ad advice and information, go to field days, look, look at webinars, etc., because uh, this will all feed into your knowledge and your ability to, to contribute to the planning of your future management. Okay. And um, I suppose just another question that came in as well, maybe Oliver, you might take this one. Um, it came in from an owner with a small birch and alder plantation where the trees are about four to five metres tall. They're asking at what stage they should consider thinning that plantation. Well, both birch and alders are rapid growth producers. Um, so on good sites, they can reach a height of 24 to 25 metres uh, 
in 40 to 50 years for birch, maybe in uh, 60 to 80 years for alder. Now, being pioneer species, um, they do not withstand competition from neighbours. So early thinning intervention is very, very, very important and must be heavy and frequent. So that means you go in before the, even the crowns have, have uh, um, come in contact with one another. And that means taking out 50% of the trees, up to 50% of the trees. Now, this in turn will actually improve your stability of the trees as well by heavy pruning or heavy thinning, I should say. So uh, competition can uh, best be controlled by thinning around the crowns of the trees selected for the final stand. Now, if the crowns are restricted or delayed uh, or light thinning takes place, uh, this will increase the risk of um, epicormic shoots uh, developing. And in the case of uh, alder, may result in the trees being too small to, uh, to have any significant value before the onset uh, of root rot, which occurs approximately around 70 or 80 year old. Okay. Trees. And Oliver, just in relation to height there, the trees are currently about four to five metres tall, a bit early yet for beginning. I would, I would say, yeah, I'd say you're looking at maybe when they're around the six metres there, thereabouts, you want to be watching out. Um, as I say, if, if particularly with birch, if the, the crowns are, are, are starting to meet and you let them encroach on one another, even uh, going in at that stage may sometimes the, the trees may not respond uh, too quickly. So it's okay. important before they, before they start to uh, encroach on one another. Yeah, and Ian, I might just ask you this one. Um, a question came in there as well about someone who has ash, oak and alder in, in one plantation, I presume planted at the same time. Do they thin them all at the same time? Um, no, not necessarily. The, those three species would be growing more than likely at different growth rates. So you may thin them at about the same height. So when each of those species have reached about the same height, maybe about eight meters, you may thin them. But the times that they reach those heights may differ. So maybe you'd, you'd go in with, um, with the ash and the alder um, and go in at, at the same time with those two, because if they're about eight to 10 meters high, you could go in. But the oak will take longer to reach that height. And maybe you go in and do the oak and do the first thing of oak at the same time that you're doing the second thinning in the other two species okay. um, to Thanks. try and minimize the costs. Mm -hmm. um, we'll now move over to John Casey, who's been handling some of the questions that came in tonight. Um, have there been many questions coming in, John? Uh, well, certainly too many to actually type an answer to anyway. Uh, but yeah, there's quite a few. So I suppose initially some of the questions are about uh, the the initial uh, shaping and pruning. If you prune a tree that has forked, how long does it take to actually for it to straighten out, or how long will it, you know, when will it straighten out? Would be one of the first questions. The second question then involves just later on in the pruning itself. Um, when do you start high pruning? And is it ever too late to actually do high pruning? So maybe Oliver or Ian would like to answer. Well, I know that, sorry, I know that in relation to, to birch, birch is mostly self pruning and it shouldn't need too much, um, uh, too much uh, pruning, um, provided, you know, the, the material, you've used good trees. With the young broadleaves, um, it, it's very much species dependent. So you'd have a species like maybe cherry or sycamore, which is, uh, would be considered apically dominant. In other words, the, the main leader grows very straight, heads for the sky, straight as an arrow. And a, a species like oak, which tends to wander a little bit, could become a little bit multi-forked. Um, and takes its time to find its 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 way, sort of as as a as a main stem. So there could be more work in um, getting your oak to develop um, its main straight leader, uh, as opposed to a species like like sycamore and uh, cherry that will will do a lot of the hard work um, at an earlier stage for you as a forest owner. It may also be worth just noting that um, that whilst the, the form of shaping and pruning does give you a, a straighter stem on, on the outside, that defect is still there inside, the tree just grows around it. So um, you still have that, that defect there in the centre, but because you've pruned, it is there in the centre. And if you hadn't pruned, it would continue outwards because the branch would still be there. And so um, maybe just to, to keep a, an eye on that as well. 
And I would just add, I suppose, maybe, you know, in the Midlands, in that year or two, we would have got a bit more frost. And sometimes, you know, trees can get defective from frost as well. So, you know, carrying out shaping maybe, you know, in, the, in a few months after it might sometimes be beneficial to the crop as well. Okay. Um, there's been a couple of questions then about just people's expectations about their woodland. And uh, as Newland mentioned earlier at the start, this is more about the technical management and how to uh, grow the crop. And there will be a timber marketing event on, on the 7th of October that will talk about uh, broadleaf marketing. But maybe people's expectations of roughly when will they tin and how much will come out of tinning or what are the future markets of broad or future markets of broadleaves and are there actions that they need to take now in order to ensure that it's not just firewood that they're going to produce. So maybe one of you would like to address that. Well, but um, I would always recommend people to, to do the forms of shaping and to do the pruning because you will end up with straighter stems and straighter stems tend to be able to be used for more markets than stems that are crooked and which can only be used generally for firewood or pulp. Now you can use a straight stem for firewood and pulp as well if that's your wish um, but if you do the forms of shaping and pruning that does open up more markets in the future for you. Um, and in terms of the, the thinnings, um, we have a, a project at the moment that's looking at first and second thinnings of alder and those the uses for those. That's coming to a conclusion later this year, and there'll be results published from that later this year. I think that the, um, just to add, uh, you know, the focus of tonight's webinar is all about the management that's required to, um, you know, bring your young trees to that stage of quality that um, they have the opportunity to grow into tall, um, straight, um, large diameter stems, which uh, by their nature will offer a, a wider market. Now, there's no doubt about it in Ireland at the moment. Um, there is an issue with what markets are there for larger hardwoods. But I mean, if we consider the, the, the rotations of some of our species, you know, 60 years up to 100 years plus, uh, it's, it, it certainly might be a cross-generational issue. But uh, I think we have to really look and grow for the future uh, and concentrate on quality. And I've no doubt that those timber markets will come. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, it's, I'm as an advisor, when you go and you see a plantation that has recently been shaped, um, I, I, it's always a joy to see, I think, you know, you know uh, because generally with, at year four, the maintenance stage, um, maybe the, it has been shaped once, but after that, then maybe it's it's up to the owner. So, you know, and a lot of owners uh, I do see do take it on and they do enjoy doing it, um, you know, and, you know, you don't have to do a lot every day, but, you know, most shaping or uh, formative shaping is probably is easier to carry out during the winter months uh, when you can see the blemish is much easier and um, it, to me it always looks better when, when it's always see, it's always great to see a plantation has been shaped rather than going into a plantation that hasn't and you know you can see because maybe it should have been done earlier or, you know pity it wasn't done a few years ago and it, it would give you a, a greater um, selection issue to be able to select your final crop trees from or your potential crop trees from because sometimes you see a, a fork maybe three feet above the ground um, and it could be a perfectly straight stem apart from that but because it wasn't shaped at the proper time um, you know it, it, it doesn't make the cut if you, if you know what I mean you know so, so I think it's always good practice to see uh, uh, individual owners taking on the, the shaping of the of their crop and the pruning probably will be at a later stage maybe after your first thinning but certainly I think if it can be shaped maybe two or three times it, it does certainly enhance most crops. And John I I think there might have been a question there on, on sort of what comes out in the first thinning there and I know Kevin did allude to it there in one of the videos but very quickly Typically, uh, you're, you're going to remove about 30 to 50 percent of the stems, which, again, is, you know, it is a heavy, it is a heavy thinning. Now, it will depend on individual forest conditions, uh, but that would equate to about typically 35, 30, 25 to 35 cubic meters of the volume or, or timber, timber coming out. Um, as I said, like that would be considered quite a heavy thinning. But as, as again, as Kevin referred to the crowns as the engine of the tree, we have to have the engine working at full speed. And by freeing up those crowns by by removing sufficient number of competitors, uh, that 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 is the key to success. 
Yeah, and even following on to that, sometimes when you see maybe 30, 40% of the trees being removed, you think it's quite heavy. But come back a year or two and, you know, the crowns have started to fill in. So, you know, it's, it, and it's better to have gone stronger rather than lighter, I think, you know. So if, you, if it, Once you're leaving the better trees behind, that is, you know. So. One, one of the other questions that's come up actually is also continuous cover forestry, and particularly if you're transitioning a perhaps a conifer plantation into a broadleaf species. Uh, and uh, whether what species do you use? I was making the point that species are broadly species are more site demanding, but uh, it is possible to do, and and there are uh, grants available and there are schemes available for this kind of option. Uh, is that something you want to be like to comment on? Yeah, I think. Sorry, I think I think obviously one of the things about converting, um, you know conifer to a broadleaf under CCF is, as you mentioned there, to make sure that the site is suitable for, for conversion. Uh, and there's two aspects to that. One, that um, the, the soil is, is adequate to, to, to grow a, uh, you know, a, a productive uh, broadleaf crop that you may also need to look at, you know, shade tolerant species initially. Uh, but also what's very important with the CCF is that the site is also stable, that there's, the, the soil isn't too shallow or too wet, uh, and that when you start to thin out your, 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 your conifer, that you, you begin to experience wind blow. So um, I think these are, th these are important factors to consider. It's also uh, worthwhile just considering the method at which you would be introducing the broadleaf species, whether you're aiming to try and get it in through natural regeneration, through seed coming in from hedgerows and from elsewhere within the landscape, which then implies that you have to have those species um, close by to you. Or you may look at underplanting, and if you're underplanting, then that can bring its own issues as well, particularly if you're in an area that's got, um, got he heavy deer um, presence. Um, and then also looking at, um, rather than doing a heavy thinning, but putting in small, taking out small groups of conifers to make um, small coops that you can then plant, underplant broadleaves into that would then be open more to, to a higher amount of light than if it was just through the dappled shade of an, a normal thinning within conifers. But there's, there's a lot there to be thinking about if you are looking at converting um, through CCF from conifer into broadleaf rather than clear felling the conifer and replanting with board leaves. Um, and then going back to the pruning issue again, uh, there seems to be a lot of interest in pruning trees at the moment. Uh, one of the questions being asked is, is it possible to prune too high up the tree? And when is the most appropriate time to prune broadleaf? Well, um, I'll take that. Uh, I suppose we try and prune up to six metres. Um, that's what our, our um, extendable saws um, reach to. So we're trying to get six metres of a clean bowl. Um, um, and the appropriate time, I suppose, is maybe after the first thinning, when you have um, um, marked your PCTs, um, and you concentrate your effort on the PCTs as well, that you're not pruning possibly every tree. You know, you're, you're concentrating your effort on the your potential final crop trees. Um, the time of year, I'm not sure, uh, uh, you know, um, I suppose it depends on, on when the available labour is about as well. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I, 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 I wouldn't have any great um, thoughts on when, when it should or shouldn't be done, but um, certainly um, it's important. I think it's a, a very important uh, function and probably equally as important as uh, formative shaping especially concentrating your effort on the, on the better trees. If and I then, can just add there that, um, you know, the high pruning uh, up to six metres, I mean, it, probably advisable not to do that maybe in one, in one operation, but to maybe, um, you know, gradually do it maybe over a couple of different operations. And also to make sure that you don't, you know, remove too much of the live crown. Um, uh, so if you have a, an eight metre or a 10 metre high tree, um, you know, do not prune up to eight meters or ten meters, or, or you know, leave uh, plenty of deep crown uh, so that uh, the tree uh, has uh, adequate um, photosynthesis, etc., opportunities to, to to grow on and stay healthy. Uh, and Lee, you mentioned earlier on about you know um, that you would prune after first thinning. One of the questions being asked, of course, would mixed species such as Scots pine and oak 
when would you start removing the Scots pine and do you move, remove it all at cross thinning stage or do you retain some of them or what would be recommended? Well, I suppose the main thing is that you don't let it overtop the, the oak. Um, that, that's the critical thing. And uh, we would certainly have seen that maybe with the, the um, large species um, rather maybe than the Scots pine. Um, um, it's very important that it doesn't overcrowd or over uh, go above the, the oak. If it does, it's important to get in there and, and remove the north species at, at that stage. Um, we used to say maybe take out two lines out of three and maybe take out, uh, leave some of the, the Scots pine for, for colour or, you know, there's a nice red hue through it and some people like to retain some of the Scots pine. Um, what I do see mostly, it's difficult to to uh, leave trees within lines to take those, uh, the trees that you're taking out. So most times I see most of the conifer species being, being removed. John, we have time maybe to one From a two. practical point of view. Yeah, John, we have time for maybe one or two other short questions, if you, if you can pick some critical ones there. Um, like I said, a, a lot of the questions is, are about thinning and that kind of thing. One of the questions was about whether thinning is subject to the same rules as hedge cutting, as, as in that it can't be done during bird nest, nesting season. Uh, it, same rules don't apply, I, I understand, until unless it's a hen harrier or a, a, another uh, special area. Is that correct? And any other last questions there, John? Or? Um, no, uh, no. Again, the thinning and pruning and bird nesting was it came up again. Okay. Uh, the, I suppose the very last one, maybe for Oliver, would be how well would birch grow on shallow wetland? Only birch would suit that sort of that sort of um, uh, soil, so it would. Um, now, not silver birch. Wouldn't plant silver birch into that. Uh, but downy birch would would certainly grow in um, in that. Type. Now you mightn't get great trees out of it, but at least they'll survive in it. Um, shallow wetland, um, alders as well. Well, you know, alders will do in wet wet conditions as well. Again, alders don't like to be sitting in waterlogged conditions for very long. It'll encourage the spread of of phytophthora. But if you have running water, that's fine. Um, so either of those two species, either downy or or, or, or alder. Okay, John, uh, thanks for organizing that or coordinating that. Uh, we're now coming towards the end of this webinar, but uh, before we finish, I'd like to thank our expert panel of Liam Kelly, Noel Kennedy, Oliver Sheridan, and Dr. Ian Short. Um, I'd like to thank John Casey, who collated your questions, and Stephen Mayan in the background there, who managed a lot of the logistics for this event. Um, Kevin O'Connell, whom you met in the forest, and of course, Justin Good, who's the forest owner and, uh, who's, and is also a forestry consultant and whose forest we used in this event and who also used the chainsaw that you saw in the video there. Thanks to the forestry division of DAFM and also to other Chagas colleagues who made this happen today. And of course, thanks to you, our valued audience, for your many questions and for watching and hopefully you enjoyed this webinar and found it useful. Um, a recording will be available in the near future on our website and if you want to make sure not to miss out on future events and to keep up to date on forestry issues, please sign up to our forestry e-newsletter. And the link to that is on our website, which is chagas.ie forward slash forestry. And we are working on more events and webinars. And if you have suggestions on topics that you think might be useful, we're very, very happy to hear those. And our next National Broadleaf event will be Talking Hardwoods. And this is a marketing event and will take place on October the 7th. Keep an eye on our websites, etc., for more details closer to that date. So until we meet again at upcoming events, both virtually and hopefully in the not too distant future, face to face, thank you for watching, stay safe and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best.